So a very warm welcome to our final session this evening on this opening day. Now, as you know, this forum is exploring the issue of ethical leadership. But I think this session is really a chance to get granular and to really ask what ethical leadership means in practice. And that's why we're going to be asking for the next hour how ethical and spiritual leaders can contribute to reconciliation and the saving of lives. So a very practical example of a byproduct of ethical leadership. And of course, that critical question of how can ethical and spiritual leaders contribute to reconciliation and the saving of lives is particularly appropriate when we, we think of the current war in Ukraine and the current war in Gaza. We are going to have two different takes on this question. For the first hour, we'll be hearing from a religious perspective, from those from religious organizations. Um, and then in the following hour, we'll be hearing for, from some policymakers who are engaged in various ways from government or the UN um, with religious leaders to try to promote peace and reconciliation. And I'll be your moderator for both sessions. Um, I'm Alison Hilliard and I'm the program director at an organization called Wilton Park. And Wilton Park is part of the UK government's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And it was set up just after the Second World War to promote peace through dialogue. And I think we would all agree that dialogue to promote peace is necessary now as never before. But one of the dialogues and the tricky issues we've been dealing with in the last five years in partnership with Globe Ethics and in particular with, with Fadi Dow is to bring together religious leaders from the Middle East to hammer out really what it means to live together uh, uh, representatives of different religious communities, what it means to live together, what peaceful coexistence means, and how religious leaders can promote that. We've been doing that for about five years, and then came the war in Ukraine, and then the war in Gaza, and that dialogue stopped. It's been very challenging to know what religious leaders have been saying, about the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza. Um, have they been talking about the sacredness of all life? Have they been doing what our earlier speakers highlighted? Earlier speakers today talked about um, religious leaders bringing hope, um, talking about uh, values, talking about care of the other. Um, so I suppose we're here today to put some flesh on whether religious leaders coming together to speak for peace and to promote peace, whether it's had its day and whether actually they have anything to say when times get tough and in times of conflict. So it's a very uncomfortable space and I'm really glad that our four panelists are here, each with their own experience to share with us, hopefully to also bring us a bit of that hope. Um, but thank you. Um, really tricky questions. Um, and I think there are no easy answers to the questions that we're raising. So if you have any questions of your own, then do use the QR code that should be, there we are on the screen behind me, um, and do ask your own questions and we'll put them to the panel as well. So let me introduce our panel. So first of all, we have um, Diki Sofjan, thank you for joining us, from the Indonesian Consortium for uh, Religious Studies, a center for interreligious study and dialogue that works to achieve peace in Indonesia uh, and worldwide. Kenneth, you are very welcome. Um, Kenneth Matata, the Programme Director for Public Witness and Diakonia of the World Council of Churches based here in Geneva. Um, our ne next guest, uh, guest is um, George Vlantis, the director of the Volos Academy for Theological Studies in Greece. And finally, pleasure to welcome you, Draw, and Draw Rubin, the chief uh, facilitator and field coordinator of religious engagement um, in Israel uh, for Search for Common Ground. And Search for Common Ground, as I'm sure many of you know, is a leading um, NGO and dedicated to peace building. And I think 
um, draw, congratulations are in due. You've just been awarded the Victor Goldberg Prize for Peace in the Middle East for your, your work. So congratulations on, on that. So we are in good company to tackle some of those difficult issues. Let me dive straight in and ask you in turn, what do you think the contribution of ethical and spiritual leaders is to reconciliation and the saving of, of lives? Dickie, do you want to start? Sure, thank you very much, Alison. So I come from a, um, a university background and we basically like to assume that we provide upstream solutions. So basically many of our uh, students, PhD students are religious leaders in their own sort of respective rights. So we have a lot of pastors and um, Catholic priests and um, Ustads who um, are taking our PhD programs and many of our PhD graduates have, have come from you know, 18 different countries. And so um, one of the things uh, that we have found out uh, in, in our sort of community engagement with the different religious communities is that you know, the word dialogue is insufficient. We find that you know, um, we've seen many dialogues being held you know, where you get the religious leaders on the stage and then putting their hands together and taking the photo op. I mean, that, that is the sort of stereotypical you know, idea of an interfaith dialogue. So what we have um, thought of is that maybe dialogue is not enough. So we tend to think now in terms of dialogue in action. So we get religious communities and faith uh, communities to work together, you know, in a, in a more functional way, in a more sort of instrumental way that would not get away with our sort of uh, differences in our theologies and, and spiritual practices and so on. So right now, uh, like we are involved in a lot of initiatives related to, for instance, the uh, Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, for instance, and we have programs to teach religious extension officers uh, and basically not to teach religion, but to teach about religion. So knowing the sort of context in which they are working in, knowing the politics, the society, the cultural, and, and all of the sort of um, context that different communities are uh, experiencing. Because one of the things that we learned was that, you know, for the most part, faith communities uh, do experience more or less the same kind of issues. So we've got a program on, for instance, religion and the internet. And we have confirmed that many of our religious communities are facing more or less the same kind of problems. You know, the sort of echo chamber effect and the marginalization of minority groups, both offline as well as online reflected in the social media and so on and so forth. Uh, we are also, um, we have sessions on uh, religion and human rights, religion and human dignity. So basically this is to get the religious leaders to understand that many of the experiences uh, experienced by these uh, faith communities are actually experienced by the other uh, religious communities in different ways and different contexts. Thank you. Kenneth, maybe I can come to you. So that question again, what for you is the contribution of ethical and spiritual uh, leaders in reconciliation and the saving of lives? Yes, I, I come from the, the World Council of Churches um, uh, and it's, a, it's helpful for me to look a little bit back uh, because next year is 100 years since a very important uh, conference was held in Stockholm where a bishop of Uppsala Nathan Soderblom brought together many, many actors uh, from different churches all over the world to reflect on the First World War. And that time, this was considered one of the greatest uh, 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 conferences on peace that had been held after the First World War. And of course, we know that he went on to receive the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1930. The, his work led uh, to the formation of the World Council of Churches. For those who may uh, not uh, be aware, the life and work uh, 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 processes from there on uh, developed and the World Council of Churches was formed in 1948. Fast forward uh, 1964, Martin Luther King uh, is a Baptist uh, a priest who is a championing a, a, 
a, a, an agenda for, for racial justice. Uh, and uh, of course, in 1964, he also receives a Nobel Peace Prize. And the, in, when it is announced in December that he is being given this Nobel Peace Prize, they say they are doing this because they realized someone was championing an agenda for peace through nonviolent means. So he is celebrated for making this huge uh, contribution. Uh, 20 years later, 1984, uh, Desmond Tutu in South Africa is working in a very complex environment, but uh, uh, provides a, a formidable force from the churches uh, to end a racially based injustice society in South Africa. Uh, and of course, he also uh, receives uh, a Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 19, uh, 1984. You can go on and mention the Dalai Lama, who also received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. What does this, this mean? It means that there is a recognition that uh, religious leaders, spiritual leaders, uh, can have an influence uh, that uh, uh, a champion lasting peace. But the question is, what, what is characteristic of these leaders in their contribution to peace uh, and reconciliation? That uh, separates that uh, separate them from all other religious leaders because there are religious leaders who fan conflict, there are religious leaders who contribute to violence, there are religious leaders who create, uh, who deepen fragmentation in society. So that's why I think the topic is relevant. That it's not them being spiritual or being religious that separate them from others. Uh, it is because they are ethical. And you can see their ethical uh, uh, positioning in their courage. Uh, you can see their uh, ethical uh, uh, positioning in their visionary uh, outlook, where they, they see a possibility in the future uh, that includes more people than even people only in their, in their own faith. Uh, but uh, also because uh, they are courageous as they take these steps because uh, they, uh, they have uh, to... Uh, to confront forces both within their own religion and uh, and outside. Thank you. It's very good to be reminded of the history of that, how religious leaders have played that pivotal role in peace and reconciliation, and also that it's not religious leaders per se, it's their character and confronting both what's in doing that. Let's come straight up to date with what's happening today with the war in, in, in Gaza and, and go to you, Dror. I mean, we've got today tens of thousands of people yesterday and today out on the streets of Israel. What for you is the role of religious leaders and the contribution of religious leaders in reconciliation and the saving of lives in the very difficult situation you come from? Um. I think that I would like to start saying first that I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be here. As my wife told me, you have a few days to breathe because the situation in our homeland is so difficult and um, the, tra the tragedy of both sides. Um, of course, I hope that following my words, you'll understand that my efforts as a mediator is not to see one side pain and to neglect the others. Um, 40,000 Palestinians were killed in the last year, thousands of Israelis. Um, a friend of mine, one of the hostages, was murdered yesterday, a few days ago, but just now the funeral is happening, taking place. You know, we are in a, you know, in, in, in deep in the tragedy, and I think that my work as a mediator with religious leaders started 2016. And since then, I have to admit that the situation just got worse. And I was thinking before watching those three beautiful entrepreneurs, you know, taking responsibility about problems in their society. And I'm asking myself, where are the Israelis and the Palestinians that have so much, you know, think that they contribute and encourage why we don't hear them and you know and and i think that it's sometimes easy to put all the um, blame on the leadership that unfortunately we have on both sides but 
you know, we 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 can't give up. I think that to describe my work with religious leaders in the past eight years, I have to. I, I'll, I'll I'll start by think, saying that, you know, the question whether the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a religious conflict is a question that everybody has different perspective about. And of course, I think that we can agree that there are some elements that are religious. We can see the situation in Jerusalem that fueling, you know, um, emotions and, and of course, uh, violence so easily. Um, I think that it's very important not to let the radicalism forces that unfortunately controls now both societies to win. We must work hard as much as possible. And my work is with religious leaders, Jews and Muslims. And the question that I approached them was, so you say all the time that the negotiations that happened in Oslo and, and after was a secular negotiation and religious issues were not taken in consideration, etc. And you're also saying that, you know, peace is such an important, maybe the most important value in Judaism and Islam. So where are you? Why we don't hear you? Maybe you can, you know, bring your voice. Maybe you can influence the situation also among decision makers, but also among communities. And we started working with 40 religious leaders, Jews, Muslims, men, women, even though for women in Judaism and Islam, the, the meaning of, of being a religious leader is, is not yet formally defined in general. And we insisted that, you know, as women has so much, you know, flexibility and responsibility to the society, we must include women because if we will stay only with religious leader men, we won't, you know, get anywhere. And, uh, and that was very important message or lessons that we heard, uh, had from that project. So I think that for them, it's very hard to um, speak about issues that they see as more political than religious. So when we stayed more in religious context for them, it was easier to move on and to influence. And, and I think that everybody is that involved in dialogue knows that when you manage to bring, you know, people from different contexts and background to the same room and you manage to build, you know, the right process step by step, you manage to build trust, it's happening. It has it has its effect. And I think that we saw that. Um, we didn't give up, of course, after October 7th, but um, when, just I'll, if I have time to describe two short examples, I'll say that we approached our Muslim religious leaders following the October 7th attack, and we asked them if they are willing to publicize a call as Muslim religious leaders to free all the civilians that were taken, you know, babies were taken as hostages. And they said, too political. We were so disappointed. And we said, no, it's moral values. It's not. And they said, but Israel has captured so many Palestinians in prison without trial. What's that? Wow. And then it goes to political discussions that, of course, as mediators, it's not our role. And when we approach the Jewish religious leaders, we ask them, you know, the war is going to take life of thousands of people. Gaza will be punished and Gaza will be demolished after you know what happened. We must take responsibility of life of innocent people in Gaza. You need to publicize, of course, we didn't use those words, but and they said, but you know, my son is in the army, and you know, my 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 cousin was killed, and it's it's a uh, very hard work, but but so these we're are not really tricky, up. tricky reasons why people don't speak out and why religious leaders don't say what the outside world might expect them to say, and some reasons towards 
perhaps the silence that people feel there have been in a very complicated situation, but lots to go back on there. But, but, but George, can I bring you in? Because I know you were behind one initiative where you felt with the war in Ukraine that you could no longer stay silent and you didn't want your fellow Orthodox leaders to stay silent and you wanted to have a, a very clear message of what you felt um, should be said in that conflict. Can you tell us a little bit about the declaration that you were behind and why for you, it was important to have a very clear message? Well, thank you, Alison. Of course, uh, I was uh, not the only one uh, behind this declaration. We're talking about the declaration on the uh, Ruski Mir Russian world teaching issued by the Volos Academy for Theological Sciences. The director of the academy is here, I'm associate of it. I'm director of another institution. And also uh, by the uh, Orthodox Center at the Fordham University. You know, when the war started, whole humanity was under shock. And for the Orthodox family, the shock was greater and deeper because it was about a conflict between two countries which are counted as traditionally Orthodox because the great majority of people is Orthodox. And uh, we Orthodox theologians were of course shocked, but we also experienced a very deep feeling of shame. We are, we are in Switzerland and uh, I had uh, once the honor to meet Hans Küng, a great theologian who once, or I think many times said, ich schäme mich für meine Kirche. I feel shame for my church. Of course, for another reason. I can say as an Orthodox Christian that I feel shame for my church, for the Orthodox church family, and for almost all Orthodox church leaders with the exception, with a vital, fundamental exception of his All Holiness, who was actually the only one who from the very first moment, in absolute clarity, condemned the war. And we felt shame, not only because of the silence or the implicit support Orthodox Church leaders provided to the war for Ukraine, but also for the attitude of the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church, who provided supposedly theological arguments to legitimize this war by saying that it's about a metaphysical issue, that we support this war because we want no homosexual parades in Russia. Uh, it was uh, really shocking. And many Orthodox theologians said, well, you know, it's enough. The world should not have the impression that this is the world and the position of orthodoxy. And if church leaders remain silent, the leaders are just members of the church. They are not the church. And we issued a declaration. It was a great success, not only an orthodox one, it became an ecumenical document signed also by important ecumenical actors, Rowan Williams, among many others, 1,500 signatures, translating dozens of languages. And uh, yes, what we wanted to say is, please be prophetic. Jesus Christ, the gospel, should have the priority, nor the nationalistic interests or ideological positions of the one or the other. Nation. So you wanted to say, let's be prophetic. As I understand it, the heart of the declaration was to say, you felt that religious leaders should not just pray for peace, but to actively and prophetically stand up and, and condemn injustice to make peace, even at the cost of their lives. So the highest calling of your ethical leadership was actually to work for peace, even at the cost of your, your own life. And I suppose I wonder if that's your view of religious leaders, whether at the very bottom line, their calling should be to make peace their highest 
most prophetic calling, even at the cost of their own lives. And I say that been very aware of what drawer you've had to say, that one has said, my son's in the army, I can't say anything. One said, my son's in prison, I can't say anything. But whether that should be the, the ideal. Well, I wonder, maybe I'll pass to Kenneth before I come back to you, Drew. Do you think that should be the highest calling of a religious leader, how they should display their ethical leadership to put peace before everything else? Yes, I, I can only speak from uh, my uh, religious background, being a Christian, because the, the last act uh, of Jesus on the cross was to say, uh, forgive them. Uh, he acted uh, on a commitment for peace and reconciliation and subsequent uh, Christian interpretations uh, of that death uh, was that he left a responsibility to the church to become ambassadors for peace. So. Um, the, and, and I think this is why uh, going back to the past is also helpful because we have learned from the luminaries of uh, those who championed peace in the past that uh, it was costly. Um, and we know that four years before Martin Luther King spoke at the WCC assembly, uh, just a few weeks before he was shot dead we know what happened to, to others who have been championing peace. Peace is not, is not cheap. And, and I think that's why our conversation uh, on reconciliation, uh, it's very easy that sometimes reconciliation becomes a word to hide behind so that this reconciliation is without justice. But if it is meaningful reconciliation, it has uh, consequences uh, for, for, for justice and if we are true witnesses, uh, sometimes uh, uh, people's uh, lives are on the, on the line. I wonder too, is there an ambivalent role that religious leaders have that they have to look to their own people? They have to care for their own people. And yet the call there is that peace is costly. They also have to be prophetic. And there, there's a tension in that. And I, I wonder if that lies behind what you're saying, Drawer, as to why perhaps there has been this silence over the, not from everybody it has to be said, but, uh, but many people have remarked on how they haven't heard from religious leaders as to what's happening in Gaza. Yes, and, and maybe I'll start by also give some optimism about the situation uh, in our region and, and specifically about our work with religious leaders, because we saw we have been working with religious leaders, as I mentioned, for the past eight years. And one thing that was really has changed was their responsibility towards education in their communities. How, for example, Jewish children learn about Islam, what they know about Islam. Unfortunately, Islam among majority of Jews is percepted very negative. And I guess the opposite on the Palestinian side, Judaism is more the face of the occupation, the settlements, etc. It was very important for us to change perceptions and to show that, you know, as religious leaders, but also as the followers, as a, at the religious communities, we can choose the leadership. We can choose the radical leaderships that, you know, give us very, um, 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 uh, simple solutions to everything. And we can choose religious leaders that gives us complexity and knows how to explain that, for example, among Judaism, there are extremists that use religious texts in order to fulfill their ideology, I guess, equivalent in other religions and societies. And we have managed to reach, I think, or 400 institutions, um, Jew Jewish institutions and Muslim institutions that they came as couples, a Muslim leader and a Jewish leader to speak with students in universities, high schools, religious you know, seminars that, that from that developed an educational curriculum about Judaism and Islam in the Holy Land, how we can bridge between the two religions and dealing with, for example, the sanctity of Jerusalem. What does it mean for Muslim, the sanctity of the city in front of Jewish students? And what is place that we know 
when we are Jews and going to pray on the Western Wall and we see the mosque, what does it mean for the, you know, the people that lives two kilometers from us? So I think that among or in this context of education, community influence, we could see the fruits of our work and investment. And I wonder if I could bring Dickie in on that, because is that one of the fruits of interfaith dialogue? Because interfaith dialogue, I suppose, has really flourished in the, in the last um, few decades. Whether you think that education and people building relationships and building trust has been a fruit of the work that you've been engaged in. Absolutely. I think education is the sort of antidote to all of the sort of distrust uh, between and among religious communities. Um, but education is a very powerful yet very slow uh, sort of impacting force, you see. Um, hence, uh, while we deal with the sort of slow process of education, we have also been engaging in the literacy, the religious literacy program, which we thought uh, would be much more strategic, which would be much more sort of a hands-on and uh, really based on the sort of realism and the context that uh, we've been living in. And so we've trained uh, through the help of the FCDO, uh, and the British Council to train 1,000 religious extension officers. And, uh, and then after that, we now have extended this program and is being supported by the Mennonites, you know, who have been very active in the sort of peace building sort of, uh, of frameworks and all. But aside from that, we've also noticed that um, there are strategic players out there that need this religious literacy program. And one of the most strategic groups that we've dealt with are the diplomats. And so we spoke with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia and said, you know, I've, I've come to a conclusion, I've, I've gone to many countries, I've spoken to many ambassadors, and sadly, I, I find that many of our diplomats are not very apt in terms of their analysis about religion and, and people of faith and religious communities. And that's exactly what we did. So we made a religious literacy program specifically for diplomats. So Indonesian diplomats from around the world, from as far as Mozambique, Canada, China, India, and so on. But we also had foreign diplomats from Russia, from Hungary, from Peru, Ecuador, Turkey, and so on and so forth to learn how we view religious literacy uh, in, in the sort of world of diplomacy. And so there are, uh, you know, I, we talked a lot, the, many of the earlier speakers talk about the sort of unresponsive, um, you know, attitude of the uh, politicians, the parliamentarians and uh, government officials. That one of the problems that I see is because there is that sort of crisis of transcendence, you see, that inability to see uh, a sort of a wider angle of the human history, the civilization. And this is where I think religion comes in. You know, religion has been around for thousands of years and I would guess that they would again, uh, you know, flourish for the next thousands of years, you know? And while modern nation states have just been developed and we don't know what the, you know, fate of modern nation states uh, would be in the next maybe 50 to 100 years. So there are sort of lessons to be learned. Yeah, because in my mind, religion is one of the most sustainable institutions that the human civilization has ever known. And this is something which I think not many people are aware of. That's very much the long view, isn't it? Let me bring you back to what's happening in, in, in Ukraine. How would you view that, um, George, and in terms of having published your declaration, the war continuing, and any interfaith efforts and, and, uh, around that? Well, you know, the main purpose of the declaration uh, was to tell to the Orthodox Christian leadership that it's very important to evaluate the criteria or the perspective under which they read the gospel. In the Orthodox churches, we face the great problem of nationalism. And many times we read the gospel under such a perspective. The Patriarch of Moscow said that the Russian soldiers who die in Ukraine go to paradise because by dying there, they serve their country. And when they save country, uh, they serve their country, they serve God. This is a horrible equation, theologically horrible, of course. But 
uh, he's not the only one who uses nationalistic narratives in orthodoxy. And the point of this declaration was not to attack Russia, but the issue of uh, nationalism in its core, and of course in uh, the variety of its orthodox contexts. And it's very important that also in Ukraine, of course, patriotism now is uh, something you have to, to count with. They have to defend their country. But it's very, very important not just to develop another nationalist narrative or whatever, but to work under the criteria of the gospel and the criteria our Orthodox tradition has. In 2018, there was established a new church in Ukraine. And it was very important for the ecumenical patriarchate who established it with a, a document um, that said, Tomos, that said, uh, you know, this is the church of Ukraine, not the church of Ukrainians. And this difference is not self-evident in the Orthodox world. Patriarchs say, I'm the patriarch of the Serbians. For the Orthodox perspective, you are the patriarch of the territory of Serbia, not of the Serbians. The others who live there are not second class. And it was very important for our understanding of Christianity to remind the leadership of these things. And now in these weeks, uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate is working very hard in Ukraine for the reconciliation between the different um, parts of Ukrainian Orthodoxy, because the tragedy of Ukraine is also a tragedy of inner Orthodox division in this one very country. And yes, I think we may have some hope that something is working. I'm going to take some questions now. Might I ask Alison, if she's in the booth, to just come and help with the questions that have come on the board. But whilst I do that, Kenneth, if I could ask a question to you to bring us back to the issue of interfaith engagement, because I think it's true to say that interfaith engagement was seen as a way to promote peace and reconciliation. It was a way to um, save lives, if you like, because it built trust. Um, and it made communities thanks very much, made communities understand each other. Do you think that interfaith engagement, is it time now to reconsider what interfaith engagement is when we hear the reality of Ukraine and we hear the reality of what's happening in Israel and Gaza? Yes, I, I think uh, what we observe is that uh, uh, we do not only have an interfaith uh, opportunity, but also an intra-faith opportunity, um, because um, it is uh, also an opportunity for uh, faith communities to reclaim their uh, transnational strength, that they are not necessarily tied to a national identity. I think it's a huge opportunity to reclaim this from an ecumenical perspective, to reclaim the oikumen, the nature of the universal nature of uh, our religious uh, identities. So, uh, but if you follow this vision for all in one, you are also making a claim of the unity of all things. In other words, uh, you are breaking barriers between people based on their race, based on their um, uh, ethnicity and, and, and so forth. So it's a, it's a big opportunity for dialogue. Uh, yes, interfaith is a very important entry point Interfaith, but also our our dialogue with nature. Many people do not realize that conflict. One of the major contributions to the climate crisis today is conflict, is war. So our relationship with nature, with the environment, is terribly disturbed when there is no reconciliation between people. So if we are looking at this from a broader perspective, from a broader horizon, we are looking at the reconciliation. Uh, of uh, humanity on the basis of their faith, on the basis of that they are humans, but also the reconciliation of all creation. Thank you. I'll just read one question that's come through, um, and it talks about religion being a big part in what's happening in Gaza and affecting, in turn, relations between Jews and, and Muslims. 
of course, this is a big question. How can this get better? We might be here all night. Um, Dor, what would you like to see religious leaders in both communities, in the Jewish community and in the Muslim community, do to try and bring about some improvement in the situation? Following what you just mentioned now, I think that's a challenge of develop religious language for reconciliation that will be implemented on both sides because there are many religious leaders, Jews and Muslims that, you know, are in shock from the situations that we are um, in front of now. And, and, and they're also, as all of us, you know, watching the news and, and asking what we can do, you know, how can we influence this tra tragedy? And I think that from the deep traumas that we are facing, maybe there will be some kind of agreement, but then the hard work of reconciliation, what does it mean to forgive, how we can use religious language in order to build a new generation that won't continue this bloodshed. I think that's the main challenge. And I think that we all see what's happening when moderate religious leaders are too quiet in front of radicalism. And we can see, of course, it's, it's uh, I feel more um, safe to speak on criticism on my side rather than to speak on the Palestinian side, but we can see how among the Israeli governments there are now ministers, religious ministers that use religious texts in order to you know, it's just horrible. And I think that I'm not alone. We have so many religious leaders that are part of those, you know, shame of what's happening around. And I think that this is time for them to act. So it's infra work and develop language of reconciliation. Maybe I can put that as a final question to you. So I'll start with you, George. You mentioned how to forgive their drawer. So is how to forgive the challenge that religious leaders have now teaching and speaking and practicing how to forgive. Perhaps that's their role as ethical leaders today. Well, yes, of course, it's a very difficult and delicate question and you cannot, you cannot uh, so to say, force forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness. And uh, we see it in many other discussions in our churches. For example, we have in the Roman Catholic Church the issue of child, uh, ch uh, child abuse. How can you say to the victims, yes, go and forgive them now to what they have done to you? It's a very, very difficult issue. It's a very difficult issue also for somebody to forgive persons who have killed members of his family. Uh, what we are reading in the news uh, is awful in Gaza, also in Ukraine, people who have lost their whole family because of the bomb which has fallen. And you suddenly lose father, mother, two uh, sisters or brothers or whatever, and you stay alone in the world. It's very, very difficult. But yes, I have to answer with a yes. The church leadership and all the, the leaders, I think, of the religions have to commit themselves in teaching forgiveness and teaching also something uh, which is very, very important to be able to pray for the other, to pray for the enemy, not as just a footnote in my prayer, not uh, in a very vague and abstract way. It would, be a very, it's, it would be a paradigm shift, but we need it. And we have resources in our churches. This is something which has been done. Allow me, but you know, I'm a Greek. And I want, I want to mention these two, res two resources, not from the Christian past of Greece, but of the, uh, from the ancient Greek one. Remember Ilias and the meeting of Priamos with Achilles, yes, with the enemy who has killed his own son, asking for his dead body. And he's speaking with Achilles, who is also mourning the death of his friend. It's a very huge, a very strong scene. Or remember that the oldest saved Greek tragedy of Aeschylus is the Persians. 
a person who himself fight it against the Persians writes a piece of theater on the war from the Persian perspective, not making a caricature of them, but trying to understand them. It's very important and we have to work on it. It's not boring, it's worth doing. Thank you. Kenneth. Yes, I think what I pick from uh, the conversation is that uh, uh, maybe it's uh, also the right time for us to, uh, to reclaim uh, or to deploy religious resources into the public sphere uh, more than we have done in the past. There, there was a, a time when uh, this public sphere became so secularized that uh, religious uh, actors and uh, uh, religious uh, resources were withdrawn and got confined only to the religious space. But we can see we are at a time when uh, society uh, is uh, desperately in need of resources that are not available in much of our secular uh, repertoire, our toolkit, the secular toolkit is not adequate to address some of the, the pain humanity is going through. And I think it may be appropriate for us to reclaim some of these resources. Forgiveness doesn't make sense, for example, to the secular world. Uh, the language we understand is kill, go and fight. I was uh, in Sweden some uh, uh, months ago at a peace conference and many people were not interested to talk about peace. They wanted to know how much the military equipment was going to be deployed for war. I think we are at a time where religious resources for peace, uh, religious resources uh, for repentance, uh, for justice, for reconciliation, uh, and uh, for power that is not based on domination, uh, to be redeployed in the public sphere as something that is normal. Please. Yeah, can I just extend that argument? So, of course, with modernization, we see secularization and we see this privatization of religion. But, uh, you know, in some cases, in, in some contexts and countries, we we did not see that, yeah. And now the only the West is now realizing that oh, there is this so-called deprivatization of religion, where religion is coming back to the fore, religion is coming back into the public sphere, and therefore you know we should be uh, fully aware of of you know religion sort of taking revenge uh, out of the um, uh, the secular world, so to speak, right? But there is there is some sort of truth in in that argument, you see, because um, you know. The argument now is that there is this sort of decline of the liberal order, and I think we are seeing this uh, quite clearly, and we are seeing this rise of religious nationalism, conservatism, populism, and so on. And many of these things have sort of produced byproducts uh, into the fore. You see, and uh, you know the idea about the Islamic State, you know, theocratic states, and and so on, and the uh, you know the Jewish state and so on and so forth. I think that has sort of complicated uh, uh, in many different ways in terms of how religious people sort of imagine what their lives could be. You know, in this modern uh, context. So I think we need to un fully sort of un un unravel the sort of political uh, context in that you know that we are living in today. You know? Thank you. Final word, Roar. And I've got a quick question for you too, but a final word as we're coming to the end of our time. I think that this element that you mentioned now, it was also very important in our work, the perception of time. Um, for religious leaders, time is not their life. Time is a continuation of generations. And, you know, looking at the reality around us for them you know it's the first time after 2000 years that there is a Jewish state and for the Muslims that under you know the Israeli or some are Israeli citizens the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza are under the occupation you know it's the first time that Islam is under a Jewish state so for them was also important 
to develop a language of what what it means that we are you know we are the state we we have minorities we for many many generations Jews you know were minorities all around the world you know under different countries and 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 empires and for the first time they need to adjust religious text to those questions so i think that it's it's also a matter of of perspective and how you can bring in more responsibility and not just to sit and discuss but also to act and that's our goal in our project to develop actions and activities and initiatives that will change the situation not just step by step. Just a very quick question before we go, and somebody has asked the question of why you don't include Christian leaders in your work, given that the churches and their leaders have been there since the, the first century. So maybe just a brief answer to that to honor the question. So it, it always the question. Um, it was, it's, 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 uh, it's not easy to answer because I can completely understand, of course, this expectation because the Holy Land is, of course, important for Christians as well. It's because we understood that the relationship between Jews and Muslim will allow Christians coming later and be part of that circle, because the tension now is between mainly between, of course, Jews and Muslims. And for example, one of our work in the last year is in inside Israel, in Haifa, the biggest mixed city in Israel, where Jews, Christians, Muslim, Baha'i, Druze live next to one another. And we have set an inter-religious committee together with the local municipality. And we have representatives of all religions because dealing with the situation of that city, you need to bring in, of course, all thank opinions. You. Well, thank you for those questions. And thank you to our panel for their really honest reflections. I mean, I've come away thinking about what religious leaders bring to the, uh, what toolkit they bring to ethical leadership. And um, we've heard um, a different perspective of time. Uh, we've heard hope, we've heard forgiveness, uh, we've heard courage and self-sacrifice. Um, we've heard repentance and reconciliation. So all very practical issues. Um, to bring to today's conflict. So thank you very much to all our four panelists. It's been, been a pleasure to have you with us and to listen for the last hour. Thank you. We're going to, we're going to move to our next panel who are going to reflect from a different perspective, but on the same question. So could I ask our panel then to take their seats um, on the floor and our next panel to come up, thank you. So thank you for staying with us. We have another hour now until our close this evening um, and another panel of speakers to give us a very different perspective on the question we've just been discussing. So the question was, how can ethical and spiritual leaders contribute to reconciliation and the saving of lives? And the panel, of course, we've just heard from, gave us their perspectives from, from a religious perspective. But good to hear the reflections of those who work with religious leaders to promote peace and reconciliation, whether that's on a government basis or from the UN or from an NGOs. Because I think it's very true to say that in the last two decades, um, religious leaders have come to be seen in policy terms as, as those who do, those who help promote the goals of the SDGs, whether it's practically getting engaged in projects on the environment or projects on water and sanitation, or whether it's the role that they play to try to put forward another narrative in contrast to the narrative of religious extremism, so that they try to promote a narrative of peace and coexistence. So it's really good to reflect on in the light of what's been happening in Gaza and Ukraine, and with the rise in ethno-nationalism, um, whether that relationship between policymakers and religious leaders 
and the involvement of the two together to work towards peace and reconciliation, whether it's changed in any way or, or it needs a, a, a reset. So again, very tricky and sensitive questions. Um, and I'm really grateful for, to my panel for, for giving us their views on them. So let me introduce them. So Michael, Michael um, Viner from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I know, Michael, you have had a close working relationship with, with faith leaders for, for many years now, and, and, and I'd look forward to hearing a bit more about that. Kushwant Singh, thank you, you're welcome, Kushwant, Head of the Secretariat of PARD, the International Partnership on Religion and Sustainable, Sustainable Development. And that convenes governments, multilateral, civil society, religious actors to push for achieving the sustainable development goals. So again, another close working relationship with religious leaders. Um, Sarah, two Sarahs. So Sarah Noble, first of all, head of global engagement at the Co-Initiatives of Change at the Co-Foundation here in Switzerland. We heard earlier from your executive director. Um, and very much a track record of working with faith groups again and steeped in the world of peace building. So thank you for joining us. And finally, our second Sarah, and Sarah uh, Markovic, the advisor on interfaith and intercultural dialogue for the Interparliamentary Union. Um, and that's the global organization of national parliaments. And again, we heard earlier in our keynote speech from your, your secretary general. So you are very welcome. Let me begin by asking all of you the same question I put to our earlier speakers, and that is how each of you think that ethical and spiritual leaders can contribute to reconciliation and the saving of lives. So a big question, but I'd love to hear your take, and particularly in the light of what you've heard from our earlier panel. Michael, I'll start with you. Many thanks indeed. I wanted to start with two very concrete positive examples. We all know about the negative examples and we can share plenty of them, but this perhaps doesn't help us. But if we have a look, a closer look at what works, then perhaps we can address what doesn't work. So the two concrete questions or, or examples I wanted to put forward, because actually their religious leaders, faith-based actors actually led spiritual and, and practical examples which lead, lead to saving lives and to reconciliation. The first one, very concrete example, um, and I def uh, deliberately wanted to take an example on gender equality and really protecting the lives of women and girls, is female genital mutilation, sometimes justified by religious leaders on the basis of religious texts. All the more important that Al-Azhar in Cairo issued a fatwa, basically saying this has nothing to do with the Quran. This is harming women, girls, physically, psychologically. This should be discontinued immediately and it has nothing to do with Islam. This has saved lives. And such religious ministries saying the same message as uh, a minister of health or, of, or, or other public authorities. It's so much more impactful to have a religious leader saying that this has nothing to do with my religious text. The second example, going further into the question of how to reconcile after decades of not having spoken with each other is from Cyprus, where the religious track of the Cyprus peace process has been bringing together for more than a decade now, the religious leaders from both sides. So Christian, Muslim leaders, and also in the context of faith for rights, also other faith-based actors. Um, and what to me is fascinating, and there are many ups and downs, so I don't want to uh, say that everything is, is rosy, but they have had very concrete examples of where religious leaders who were not allowed to go on the other side of the green line to their places of worship or pilgrims who were prevented from doing a pilgrimage. Um, but then both sides basically talking with each other and supporting each other with their respective governments and authorities. 
And this has led to more than 10,000 Muslim pilgrims actually being able to cross the green line and go to the Hala Sultan Teke in, uh, in the south. So this is a very concrete and important example. Just one more example, when there was an arson attack on a mosque, immediately the religious leaders came together and basically diffused the tensions. And this is so vital precisely to talk with each other, not when it is too late, when basically there is a risk of riots or violence, but that you know each other already and that you can actually trust each other, which I'm just alluding to one of the questions that, that came through, which is in the current context, very difficult and has not only regional repercussions in the Middle East, but really globally where interreligious intra-religious discussions seem to have been really on standstill or even broken. And this is really something that needs to be addressed urgently. Thank you, very concrete examples, Michael, thank you. Kushwant, can I come to you with the same question of how you think ethical and spiritual leaders can contribute to reconciliation and the saving of lives? First of all, thank you for inviting me. And it's really a challenge to be part of this panel um, because there are so many layers that have been discussed already that I really need to think, should I reply as the head of secretariat of part, as you said, the International Partnership on Religion and Sustainable Development, should I reply from a spiritual perspective, which in, based on my tradition would be very universal? Should I look more into the political side? So actually it's quite challenging. So let me try to start with a very principal observation. I have visited a lot of conferences and I'm sure you have visited also a lot of conferences. And I hear a lot of talking about religious leaders, religious leaders, and religious leaders. Let us go back to our, and I would say to all theologies. And what is the teaching there? That actually we are all guests and brothers and sisters, and we are one family. So I think there's a problem already in the very fact that we have this thing about religious leaders and the others. So the responsibility actually to do the right thing. And I think everyone who has some kind of spirituality left and also some humanity left, everyone knows what is the right thing to do in terms of gender, in terms of the environment, in terms of all the things. And in my tradition, we call it it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice metaphoric expression. We say there's only one religion. So people say, oh, what kind of arrogant attitude is this, right? But the answer is, it's a religion of compassion. It's the religion of justice. It's the religion of courage. It's a religion of being in tune with nature. And I have the feeling that this focus of spiritual, spirituality is being lost because of all the denominations, because of all the politics which is going on in religions too. So if religions and religious actors speak in the same way as the cunning politician and speak in the same way as the cunning businessman, where is the difference? Where is the added value? And where's the moral authority actually for spiritual people to say, by the way, because I believe in X, Y, Z, I'm actually a bit better than you guys because you believe the wrong thing or you don't believe at all. So these are the things which I think every person in this room, and I actually want to see a lot of young people here from the universities in Geneva, they should all come. They should listen to these conversations. And I want children from the kindergarten to be here. They need to be part of the conversation about values from early childhood onwards, because even the Nazis had values, right? But they had the wrong values. It's not about values. So the differentiation between the wise person and the non-wise person is that you have the wisdom to, to differentiate what is right and what is wrong with a very far-sighted perspective. And let me come to the topic of reconciliation. I think, and also in all the conversations we're having in part, and especially also with indigenous people, our understanding of reconciliation is very narrow. It's, there's a war and then we need reconciliation. What about the reconciliation when I treat my body in a bad way? Drugs, alcohol, whatever. I need reconciliation with myself. The war between men and women, 
it needs reconciliation. What we have done to nature, it needs reconciliation. And actually what I wanted to see, and I'm quite disappointed to be very honest, is that every person from religion, regardless of the background and denom denomination, should have been the Fridays for Futures. It were young people who reminded us we need to save Mother Earth. I didn't see all the religious people on the streets, right? So I am the one speaking on behalf of a partnership which says we should use the positive potential of religion to ensure that we do the right thing and that we contribute to sustainable development. But I need to be very honest because as a spiritual people, I need to be honest to say that we failed. So we need to do much more. And Fadi, you were referring to the pact of the future. What is missing? It's technicalities, it's technicalities, but there's no talk about the transformational shift we need at the level of values, at the level of our education, and how we can move away from linear thinking, which I think is the main root problem of all the problems we have, to circular thinking, which is deeply, deeply embedded in spirituality. Thank you, Kashwant. Sarah, can I bring you in? I, I suspect you might have some sympathy with that. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I recently joined the Co-Initiatives of Change Foundation um, and uh, my colleague Ignacio uh, spoke of it earlier. And this people's movement was actually created at the end of the Second World War as a way to better understand what moral values were needed to avoid ever ha that happening again. So it, what there, it was created by um, or founded by uh, uh, an, an American religious pastor. So there, are, there is a religious aspect in the in the founding of of the movement, but it was very much created as a means for anybody, regardless of religion, to access spirituality and to look at the ethical values that we need to live in a better in a better world. So, being on this panel was an interesting uh, situation for me because the Swiss. Um, Initiatives of Change Foundation is a secular foundation. We work with all religions and all faiths, and parts of the the movement also have a religious religious basis. But what I would say is the is the key um, glue that holds the movement together, and also echoes what you're saying, is this notion that whether or not you are religious or spiritual, is when we're thinking about peace, it's not looking at the outside, but it's really looking at at starting from yourself. So peace begins with me. Um, and it might seem tiny or incremental, but at the same time, we so often focus on the external factors, like they have to change, they need to do this, they need to do that. Whereas we, we don't look at ourselves, what stumbling block am I to peace in my own life, to peace in my family, in my community or my society? This may take longer um, to, to achieve, but at the same time, if we all focus more on the change that we can make in ourselves, um, and using Mohatma Gandhi's quote, be the change that you want to see in the world. If we can ourselves be ethical leaders, every person in this room, and not just somebody that is in a high level position of power or authority, everybody can be a leader and we can all make a, a change in, in the world. And I, I think this, this focus on, on be the change is something that we need to focus more on. And, and it's something that is a uniting factor because it's something that we, we can all control that. Um, there are many factors outside that we can't control. And I would say maybe a second point of, of things that we should focus more on is the notion of uh, leadership from the heart. Um, when we talk about love or talk about the heart in international relations, people sometimes kind of look at you like you're a bit kooky. I mean, we have this real focus on real politique, but at the same time, conflict divides people. And, and when you think about healing and reconciliation, it's not something that comes from the head. It's something that comes from, from the heart. Um, we had a, a forum this summer where we were looking at um, healing the wounds of the past. And we had a former uh, uh, Lebanese intelligence officer uh, who was active in the, the Lebanese civil war. And he was talking about forgiveness. And, and he, he, was set, he had issued a public apology um, in a newspaper in 2000, in the year 2000. And he was talking about how we really need to focus on, on our hearts and people's hearts. And we don't focus on that enough and, and what would happen in the world if we did. Thank you, Sarah. I'll come to you for an opening comment before. Um, there are lots of things to pick up on. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a hard act to follow. Uh, I'm coming in from the side of the cunning politician, I believe uh, you had mentioned, so I'll try my best to uh, redeem them a bit potentially. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm from the Interparliamentary Union, and you heard from our Secretary General earlier today, so I won't uh, repeat what he said, 
Um, but I do want to hone in on the emphasis that he placed on inclusion as a really key pillar of uh, ethical leadership, be it for spiritual leaders or for political leaders or for other types of leaders. Uh, and with the focus on parliaments, this idea of being an inclusive space, parliaments should ideally be a window to society. That means they should be gender inclusive, they should be youth inclusive, they also need to have inclusive mechanisms to make policy. They can have committees which uh, uh, engage with society and in terms of engaging with religion and belief, uh, when we we'll come to leadership in a second, um, they do ideally also need to be representative of the religious and belief diversity of their society and also in making policies ensure that they engage with um, their interlocutors on the other side. Um, so this inclusion really goes to the core of what makes a good and ethical parliament and hopefully saves them from being cunning or um, mischievous. Um, in terms of how and why parliaments engage with religion, our Secretary General used this term unholy alliance. I think we've heard it all, you know, they're not good bedfellows. Uh, and I think that's a bit of a shame because we're talking about leaders here and spiritual leaders are very influential in ma many parts of the world, maybe not so much in Geneva. But if we look at the Pew statistics that we're all very familiar with, we have something like 87% of people who are uh, affiliated with a religion or belief. So it's very important for parliaments, if they want to be inclusive and parliamentarians, to be speaking to those people who influence people on the ground. So it's, it's a real must, and our Secretary General said, if you want a multi-stakeholder approach, that's not just parliaments and religious or belief actors, that's everybody. They have to be one in a series of. Um, and I would like to give just one example here on just focusing on reconciliation. Uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of Bosnia and Herzegovina organized earlier this year a conference meeting of parliamentarians and religious leaders for coexistence and peace, um, and it took place in the debate chamber of parliament. Uh, and most of you will be familiar with the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It has a difficult past grounded in ethno-religious identity and conflict. And what they did was they brought together regionally from the Balkans, West Balkans region, uh, experts, and they put on the stage the four main ethno-religious groups. Um, and the speaker, um, Speaker Svidic, said it's very important for the people of Bosnia to see that visibly. So I think one of these speakers in the last panel, I think it was Dicky saying, you know, dialogue is not enough. And I absolutely agree, dialogue needs to do something, but sometimes visibility is also important. I think it depends on which part of society you are engaging with. Um, so that was a very interesting example where Bosnia said, we've been through something very difficult. We're working to get to somewhere better. Let the religious leaders speak for what was bad, but also what, what their collective existence brings next to parliamentarians who need to translate that into good legislation and policy. Uh, so that was one example I saw um, for how parliaments can live up to their potential. Um, and we've already had the, the mistrust and the need to rebuild trust uh, echoed before. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm, I'm really interested, though, that all of you work with faith leaders. So it's not just a question of reducing it to everybody having a role to play. Um, it, it is a policy decision to work with faith leaders because they can get things done. So I'm wondering, has anything changed of recent with the wars in Gaza and Ukraine in particular in interfaith engagement and in how you react with religious leaders? Michael, have you, do you detect a shift or a change? As I mentioned before, the existing interreligious interfaith exchanges, dialogues, even after decades of being in existence, have really faced serious challenges, um, which was mentioned earlier on, even here in Geneva. We had also exchanges um, in Paris and in Cambridge earlier this year, where this came through as a, as a real concern, also concretely at university levels, where students, faculty are really facing serious challenges or, or abuses. Um, so this has changed. But let me also go back to a point that uh, Kenneth and Tata already mentioned at the beginning, when he said that the secular toolkit is insufficient to address the challenges. And I think this analysis always, I mean, goes further back than 
what is happening in the Middle East or, uh, or elsewhere. So this is a crucial um, analysis and also requires actually the secular and the non-secular to really talk with each other. And that's, uh, that's a quite a nice coincidence that you used the, 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 the term, the secular toolkit, because actually for the last five years, we have together with faith-based actors worked together also with the World Council of Churches, with a host of other religious institutions, but also individuals. That's also the reason why we prefer the term faith-based actors instead of religious leaders most of whom are male and old, let's face it. Um, in that sense, the Faith for Rights Toolkit is precisely the attempt of engaging with each other, of learning from each other. So that's the reason many people were talking about the important role of education. I would I completely agree with the small tweak, I would say not education, which is very much top down. I tell you what you have to learn but peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is equal, democratic, everyone has something to contribute and something to learn, which requires first listening. And the Faith for Rights Toolkit actually started in a, in a, in a modest context and the 60 pages of trying to put together what works and what doesn't work around a host of very concrete questions, gender equality, minority rights, how to address incitement to hatred and violence, secularism, um, state religions, the role of youth, humanitarian aid, you name it. So there are 18 commitments on faith for rights. And for each of them, we have collected basically a host of peer-to-peer -peer learning examples, exercises, and mainly questions. There are hardly any answers uh, in, in, the, in the toolkit. And this has basically doubled in, in, in size within two years because we are constantly learning and adding examples and something where faith-based actors actually contribute and tell us what they have experienced, either what worked or what didn't work. And also Globe Ethics has been part and parcel from the beginning of the Beirut Declaration in 2017. So it's really also really Fadi's um, wisdom who has really contributed a lot to it. And last point, I think the idea of having at the grassroots, the wisdom trickling up, usually it's kind of trickling down that some mysterious political or religious leaders would need to basically tell everyone else what they have to do or, or not. But I think the reverse, and I'm not saying that top down is, is, is not important at all, but I think it's equally important to have the bottom up approach where actually faith-based actors, be they theistic, non-theistic, atheistic, or any other. So that's going back to the point of inclusion. It shouldn't exclude anyone. And in, in a sense, human rights law is protecting any believer. And actually everyone is in this broad definition, a believer in, in, in itself. So is that the reset that we're talking about, that it needs to be bottom up as opposed to top down? Because I think the accusation is that top level religious leaders were perhaps being manipulated or being used by states to, to pursue a political agenda. Is that the reset that needs to happen? I think the, this coupled with the peer-to-peer -peer learning approach, which is actually a very liberating thought because also any religious leader could equally participate and should participate and contribute and learn. So in that sense, it's it's really leveling the playing field, but ultimately trying to find solutions for real life problems. Kushwant. Again, a difficult one. Um, there are various observations. Again, one thing is that I'm not sure if there's a reset, but what I can say as kind of a partnership, which of course is very much linked to governments, because as you said, Alison, we are a partnership that tries to bring religious actors very consciously, not specifically religious leaders, but religious organizations and initiatives and actors who are doing great work on the ground, systematically together with multilaterals, governments, 
civil society and academics. And the idea is to have a coordinated exchange about learnings, what worked, what didn't work. So as you are saying, uh, kind of very like eye to eye level exchanges, but it's also to amplify the good work and also to showcase what worked well. And as you all know how the media works, if something is done badly in the name of religion, it's all over the newspapers. Um, if you do something good, you rarely find it in the newspapers. I have been a founding member of the largest interfaith council, I would assume in Germany. And I've been part of the interfaith work since over 20 years privately. And we did quite a few very concrete things like interfaith soul care guidelines, because of course it was heavily dominated by the Christians. But what about the Buddhists? What about the Sikhs? What about the Baha'is and so on? So when we developed that, it was no news, but actually it's very concrete work where people from different backgrounds sat together and developed something which is very universal, no news. So, I mean, the media people really told me and said, hey, Kushwan, if something happens uh, at your council and someone is killed, of course we would talk about it, but about your nice soul care thing, yeah, do it in the hospitals, but yeah, it's, no, it's not a news. So that's, that's getting even more difficult to tell the world, hey, by the way, we did something good. One positive example and one exception is the faith pavilion at the COP28. It was the very first time we had a faith pavilion at the COP. Um, and together with various organizations, we were one of the co-organizers. We tried to showcase the good work religious actors have been doing in the context of environmental and climate action. It was the first time, I think, in, in, uh, since I'm part of PART, that the New York Times a very renowned, renowned media outlet reported about it. But if I tell you about the content, what they wrote, again, it was a bit funny that we are the ones who provide soul care to the people who have climate angst, right? But what the actual content was, they didn't even talk about. So it was the typical uh, thing of uh, taking the religious actors to showcase, oh, they are very nice for interreligious dialogue and they're good for soul care. But during that COP, we wrote an open ad, a rabbi, a bishop, um, your boss, uh, Jerry Pillai, WCC, and myself about climate action, faith, and sustainability. It, it is not very morally laden doc, uh, uh, um, article, but it, it is a very inspirational article. So that's, that's an outcome of very concrete work. But what I want to say also is in terms of the challenges, in terms of the reset, since the Ukraine war, and also since the pandemics, we need to say it's getting more and more difficult to get public funding when you work very consciously with religious actors. So money is taken away. I think one of the colleagues said it, uh, never ever can we attain peace only with weapons. It's I think very clear, but if we are defunded more or less in future civil society initiatives, the space is shrinking. So I would invite everyone who has good ideas to synergize, work together, showcase the good work that people of religion, but also of course, who are other important actors of civil society do in terms of everything that is needed in terms of sustainability and to improve the well-being of nature, of animals, and human beings. We're going to take some questions in a moment and I'm proving my technical ineptitude. So perhaps I could ask Alison to come and look at the questions for me. That would be great. But whilst I do that, Sarah, just to turn to you. I mean, in some ways, are you actually saying that policymakers need to remind religious leaders that they need to look at themselves and they need to lead with the heart and that they have got this amazing toolbox that has got something real to say to the world and something real to say into situations of conflict. I think it's not just for policymakers. I think it's something that we all need to, to reflect on. And I think the, the reset, if there should be one, is really looking at at ourselves and, and this toolkit that uh, my colleague Ignacio was talking about earlier, these inner development goals, our skills and attributes to be an ethical leader, to look at what we need each and every one of us, not just leaders in position of authority, but every person in this room at the university and um, around the world, how can we all look at ourselves and become better people to have a better, a better world? I mean, that might sound a bit naive, but what we're doing right now isn't really um, 
working. Um, so this is one way of trying to accelerate progress for the for the SDGs. And I think one of the challenges that we're also seeing, not um, in terms of speaking about shrinking space, is overall globally there's shrinking space for dialogue. There's shrinking space to disagree with people. There's shrinking space to talk about peace, or there's shrinking space to talk about differences. And this is very concerning when we're trying to talk about peace. I mean, even within the peace building sector, I would say the war and, and the genocide in, in Israel and Gaza has caused huge divisions um, within organizations and within movements about what should be said, what shouldn't be said. Should we make a statement? Should we not make a statement? And I think this is fundamentally because people are seeing values that are supposed to be being followed that, that are not and such a huge um, double standard and not understanding what's happening. And, and I think this is a very, um, I mean, obviously there are huge lives on the ground and huge devastation, but it, also for the, the sector itself, I think it's, it, it will cause ripple effects. So we need to really look at how we can increase the space um, where many forces outside are looking to, to, to close it. And I would say coming back, um, I think it was something Kenneth was talking about when we, he was looking at the characteristics of um, religious leaders who had won Nobel Peace Prizes, it's looking at their their character as well, really who, who they are. And, and I think, going beyond faith leaders, it's it's who are we and who are we as, as human and, and how do we want to live? How do we want our relationship with nature to be? And what kind of world do we want to live, leave for our, our, our children? And these are the, the main questions that we should be tackling. Sarah. I'm not sure I agree with the word reset, but I think what we really need is a kind of radical inclusion. I think inclusions become a bit of a hashtag, um, but I mean, when you look at real inclusion, it's not just having all religions uh, present. It's not just having uh, female parliamentarians, male uh, youth. It's not just having global north and global south. It's then looking at all sorts of diversity criteria. Um, and I think that we really need to look at this question of what real inclusion is um, on the one hand. Uh, and that includes when we're talking with religious leaders. I think um, our panelists before talked about the Interfaith uh, Rainforest Alliance. You know, then we've got religious leaders they don't, they're not all experts for everything. So uh, what is the kind of inclusive space where we can make sure that the that all these platforms uh, are heard properly? And from the IPU's perspective, we have 180 member parliaments. So the question of inclusion is very difficult as well. I think uh, the message was made before on the previous panel, this question of religious literacy of politicians is really, really important. It's not generally part of their training. Um, and I extend this uh, to parliamentarians as well as diplomats um, or people in government, uh, that there is a real opportunity here for dialogue where they really mutually learn from each other that uh, religious leaders understand what is the mandate of a politician? You know, what does the rule of law mean and how can I behave towards that? How can I teach my congregants about the rule of law? And how can parliamentarians understand better what are religious or spiritual values? Um, and the third thing is that this idea of good practices, I don't think none, any of us need to reinvent the wheel. I think the wisdoms are out there. What we need to make sure is that we find those good practices from different spaces. Uh, and then you have religious communities, which if they're transnational communicate maybe better, but parliamentarians don't have access to that space. So I think dialogue, not for dialogue's sake, but dialogue for not investing in new projects when those traditional wisdoms are already there. So a reset in thinking maybe. Michael? If I may just add one point, obviously religious literacy is important. I would just tweak it to say faith literacy to be also inclusive of any different type of uh, belief. Um, and also vice versa, it can be very helpful to have freedom of religion or belief literacy. So the human rights side of the literacy, which uh, is sometimes also neglected. So I think both sides, if we want to really juxtapose them, I, which I don't like, but everyone has actually to gain something. And if we have the faith literacy and the freedom of religion or belief literacy kind of being facilitated through peer-to-peer -peer learning, I think this is part of the solution. Thank you. I'm just gonna take a few questions before we bring our um, evening to a close. Interesting question here. How do we get ourselves to a point where we engage people in shaping their own peace and have that influence policy? So a bottom-up approach. Who would like to take that one on? I mean, that's, that's what spirituality is about. You said it much nicer than I could ever say. 
when I understand what is the root cause of something, I can work on it. And that's actually what spirituality is all about, whether it's in terms of env environmental pollution, whether it, it's, it's in terms of violence. Uh, if I understand I am angry, it will have implications in the manifest world. The environmental pollution is the result of inner pollution. So how do I clean inner pollution? Of course, you cannot do it by doing anything outside of your body. It's actually quite simple, but these are the things that are actually lacking in the educational system. It's very much about how I, I call it the education system, the current education system, which is globally exported also to the so-called developing countries um, is how do I become a very good biological machine in a capitalist market? This is the main like focus 90, 5% of the education. Whereas if the focus would be, of course, on science and whatever, history, et cetera, but if ethics would be one of the core subjects where you learn how to be self-reflective, how to say sorry if you have messed up with your colleagues uh, in office, how to say sorry in the family, how to say sorry as a politician. A colleague today said um, when, the, when one minister from, uh, I think it was New Zealand, right? When she stepped down and said, sorry, I'm close to a burnout. Is it a sign of weakness or is it a sign of strength? And of course, honesty is always a sign of strength. So if these things are highlighted in education from early age onwards, of course, we would have a different society. So every decision maker, whether in politics or in business, should actually rethink. And you said the reset. The reset is actually at a very different level. No political reset will ever work. It has never worked. And you have seen the results in Germany. Over 30% of the population in the recent elections, they voted for right wing for right wing party in Germany with the German history. Can you believe it? It's unbelievable. But can we give these people a reproach and say, hey, you, wrote, uh, you voted for the wrong party? The problem is somewhere else. And we are kind of tackling the nitty gritties here and there at, at a technical level. So again, the art, the art, the art is about how to transform ourselves into beings that are compassionate and all the values that all religions share. I have a question from Michael and then come back to Sarah, if I may. This is another question to say, what are religious leaders doing to invest in positive peace? Uh, you may agree with this or disagree with this, but the question went on, most of their interventions are reactive, so negative peace and hence not sustainable. As I mentioned earlier, it shouldn't be reactive because that's usually then too late also whenever the religious leaders uh, are, are talking to each other. And also the positive speech, which is kind of alluded to there, has also been identified in the Beirut Declaration on Faithful Rights um, as one of the key healing tools, because by not just talking about incitement to hatred or the, the, the negative side, but by really addressing people's hearts and minds. So that's what came already through from, from other panelists, how to really change and have a transformative um, um, approach. I think there is again what speech can be in a very positive sense, or if used in a negative sense, it, it's also very dangerous, leading to incitement to violence and hatred and so on. So I think that is the key part, which to that question, I would also uh, say that the peacemaking also for religious leaders really starts with this positive speech. And peacemakers, of course, are often under threat, are often in danger of losing their lives. I know we talked about that a little in our first panel, but this question gets to the heart of that to ask, what role do religious institutions and followers have in protecting peacemakers and mediators from state and non-state violence? Sarah, do you want to take that? Well, I mean, firstly, I would say ideally a stable state does have human rights upheld, including the right to freedom of speech, uh, freedom of opinion, expression, uh, freedom of assembly. So 
Uh, I wouldn't want to go into the territory of saying religious institutions are going to end up in competition with the state because then we really have a problem with the rule of law and the rule of law has to be the common ground under which everybody stands. Um, there should be avenues in each state for legal redress. So you can make submissions, you, uh, you can come out, you can protest uh, in large numbers if you see that there is violence. I think it's a very hard question to answer when we consider the variety of states uh, around the world. What we're not seeing is working well are things like uh, military coups, which end up being a populist movement that do not lead to long-term uh, stability. So I think the, the question or the premise of nonviolence, the common upholding of human rights, which themselves are grounded in peace. I mean, if all human rights are unheld, we per se do not have a need uh, for violence and conflict because people's basic needs are being fulfilled. So I think that this upholding of the rule of law and holding the state accountable uh, to their own laws um, and taking a nonviolent approach in doing that and using the necessary mechanisms of protest, assembly, expression can do a lot, but um, I'm not sure I feel like I can say more than that. Hard question. Thank you. Let's take a final comment. Uh, we're about to finish our session. So, Sarah, if I can go to you first of all and then Kushwant. Sure. And coming back um, to the first question, I think something that each one of us can take away today is the notion of in your day to instill some what we call quiet time. So it's, it's silent reflection. We're so busy doing, doing, doing all the time, talking, talking, talking. Um, but it's this notion of, you know, when you're in a meeting, can you take after, you know, a, few, a bit of discussion, take one minute for everybody just to be quiet and silent and see what happens and see what comes from within. So coming back to this question of how do I change myself? So, so taking breaks or, or, or taking these, these moments that there's, it's, it's a small step, but it's it's also an opportunity to reconnect to to yourself so you can reconnect to, to others and that's something that we we do at initiatives of change and we call it quiet time you might call it silent reflection it's also something in many religions and faiths this this notion of silent reflection mediation um, meditation pardon me um but um that's that's something that i think everybody can take away today thank you kushwant one small thing that yes. you can take away from the our time is teaching i would just invite all of us to remind ourselves that we are guests. When I know that I'm a guest in this conference, I behave very nicely because I know ultimately I will go. So we all have in common, everyone regardless of our background, that we are guests. So if we are reminded of only that one thing, I, can, I think I'm pretty sure transformation can happen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. Sarah. Uh, I think for me, I would sum it up in talking about perspective taking. I think that's what we all need to do, whether it be from the perspective of our gender, our religion, our professional role, our country of origin, our language group, um, the importance of perspective taking and the curiosity about other people's perspectives opens doors to considering things from new angles. My key takeaway would be that the messages of mercy and compassion, which are really resonating with most believers, that they should be transformed into acts of solidarity, but really leading to concrete changes through faith-based projects, be it on developmental, environmental, uh, societal uh, changes on the ground, and really concretely at the local, regional, national, and ideally global levels. Thank you very much. And I think all our first panel would agree with that too. Thank you. Thank you very much for outlining that toolkit that I think we take away from this session um, and for the one take that we can each take for ourselves that might be transformative after our conversations. Thank you very much.